So good afternoon, and this is a short presentation with way too many slides uh, to illustrate uh, radar sounding data, which is a data set which most users are not very accustomed to, uh, partly uh, for because of us, because uh, part of the data sets are not, uh, a good chunk of the Marsis data set for, uh, is not available yet in the PSA archive, but we'll come to that later. So what are radar sounders? I will not enter into details. Uh, they use radio waves at low frequency that are capable of penetrating below the surface and get reflected by dielectric discontinuities, changes in both dielectric properties or density. So they are used to, to change variations in materials uh, below the surface. Marsis was designed to penetrate uh, at the greatest depth possible using the lowest possible frequency that would be able to pass through the ionosphere, uh, while Sherad used a much higher frequency to achieve a tenfold better resolution at the expense of, of penetration. Um, the goals that were behind the design were different. Marsis was uh, conceived at a time in which uh, we wanted to, s uh, the, the, the global description of the distribution of water in the, in the subsurface of Mars was based on, on simplified models of a mega regolith that would be a sort of sponge uh, abs containing uh, water in their pores and uh, in for a producing, resulting in a global aquifer system while uh, Sherad was eventually designed when, when the first data from, from uh, Mars Global Surveyor came in and showed uh, what was interpreted uh, as, as recent sign of aqueous act activity on the surface. Uh, this is a uh, figure which I have not uh, properly credited. It's produced by JPL, but it uses uh, and it uses Marsis, Sherad, and Mola data. Um, the topmost panel shows a topographic uh, shaded relief map of the uh, terrains across the south polar layer deposits, and uh, on the left side, the uh, Cavi Angusti, I believe. And uh, the, the two uh, figures below show the, the radargrams, which is the format uh, the, in which data are usually examined. A radargram is is a sort of vertical section of the subsurface produced by uh, stacking, uh, by putting one next to the other all the echoes acquired along the ground track of the spacecraft, and the, in which the, the, vertical, uh, uh, the vertical axis corresponds to time delay of the echo, and the horizontal axis is the spacecraft the ground track distance, and the color corresponds to the strength of the echo. Um, as you can see, uh, as you can see, in fact, yes. This is uh, the surface. Uh, it shows the surface echo, which is a bright line. And these are subsurface reflections, and this is the bottom of the south polar layer deposits, which are mainly made of ice. And uh, Mars is here sees uh, down to a depth of 3.7 kilometers, um, which is quite a bit. Um, and uh, However, Sherad, and it doesn't show well in this image, on a, on a very similar ground track, uh, is able to see a much finer structure that doesn't show well in this picture, unfortunately, on the screen, but is not capable of penetrating down to the subsurface. So the two instruments are very complementary to each other, and uh, for the best results, they should be used together. So what can you do with Mars's data or radar sounding data? Well, this is an example of what we usually do, and the most basic interpretation is to use radar guns to map subsurface interfaces and interpret them uh, in terms of a geologic structure of the area observed. This is the real data. This is a surface a simulation. A simulation of what? Of surface scattering. Uh, this is a very important uh, information uh, because the, uh, the, the antenna that the radar uses is illuminating not only directly the area directly beneath the spacecraft, but all around for, for 100 or maybe 200 kilometers, getting echoes from all manners of surface obstacles like crater edges and similar things. And uh, they these echoes, these lateral echoes that are distant from the ground track, uh, distant from nadir, reach the, uh, the, the radar at the same time as surface echoes. Uh, that is later after the, the, the nadir echo. And they might be mistakenly interpreted as subsurface echoes. 
So you need a simulation to be sure that what you are seeing is, are genuine subsurfaces. And the radar can actually work as a ionospheric uh, probe, is, but this is not really the point here. Uh, when it's used uh, massively, uh, it has been used to produce maps of the extent and volume of, of icy deposits in the polar caps of Mars, and uh, which allowed the est to estimate the, the total water content of the, of the polar caps. Um, it has been capable of seeing through the Medusa fossa formation, which is a deposit uh, at the equator of Mars that is sometimes thought to contain ice, is, uh, is either interpreted as, as a volcanic deposits or as, as, uh, as, as uh, some ice-rich regolith. Um, the data can also be used to derive some quantities on some information of the ionosphere, which is affecting, in fact, the propagation of the signal causing distortion, but uh, I'll come to that later a little bit. Uh, it has seen uh, some layers that appear to <coughs> be the remnant of some uh, previous deposit, polar deposit, but it contain a, ha a much higher dust content. And, okay. An ingenious use of the, uh, of the simulation is to compare the simulated power with the real power received by, by the radar and to map their relative variation across the surface. This relates to changes due only to dielectric properties, uh, small, uh, let's say, uh, small digression. Uh, the, what controls the strength of surface echoes is essentially the geometry, so the roughness, we call it, of the natural surface and the, the, its dielectric properties. And if you model the effect of the roughness through the simulations based on surface topography, what is left, the difference between the real data and the simulation should be related only to dielectric properties. So in this way, it's possible even to derive, in, although in some approximate way, uh, estimates of the, top, of the dielectric properties of the surface, which was used in, in this case to highlight the fact that the um, perennial cap in the South Polar layer deposits is probably mostly composed of uh, water, uh, sorry, CO2 ice, dry ice, for a thickness of at least several meters. Um, a more advanced and complex use of the data is to use quantitative information, information on power from surface and subsurface echoes to derive the dielectric properties of the medium in between and at the base of the deposits. This is a complex, uh, complex thing to do, however. And okay, this is a general map of the surface reflective surface dielectric content constant produced by using Mars's data uh, to infer the presence of uh, large quantities of ice in the northern regolith extending much deeper than the gamma ray spectrometer on board Mars Odyssey would let you uh, infer. Uh, because, of course, that instrument is capable of, or neutron spectrometer, uh, is, is capable of receiving only uh, information down to a depth of one meter or so, uh, while this information on the dielectric properties of the surface is actually some average quantity uh, uh, over a thickness of several tens of meters. So a, a very low dielectric permittivity of the surface, like the one found in the north, uh, implies that the ice content of the regolith must be high down to depth of several tens of meters, not only to the first meter or so. Uh, this is Mars's, uh, sorry, uh, switching from Mars's to Chorad, uh, you can see here that the, very, the much higher resolution allows you to infer the uh, different episodes of accumulation and erosion of the deposits uh, by mapping unconformities. Uh, it has been, Sharada has been used successfully on, on uh, uh, lava flows and uh, also to detect uh, relatively small ice deposits in lobate debris saffrons, um, as they were called at the time, and also ingeniously uh, to map the flexure below the North Polar layer deposits, implying an upper limit, uh, uh, sorry, a lower limit for the thickness of the lithosphere. Uh, because if you cannot measure the flexure here, it means that the, 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 the crust must have a certain rigidity, and if you know the age of this deposit, you can infer how thick it has to be to, su to support such weight without flexing. Um, okay, this is still the Medusa Fossa formation, which I dealt uh, briefly before, and uh, 
yes, uh, again, this is the inference of uh, the, the attenuation properties of the germinal angular material, which has consequences on the content of dust, because that's what control attenuation of the signal uh, within the ice, the icy deposits. So uh, this is how to map some sort of bulk average dust content over the thickness of the deposit. And um, there were also attempts to relate the, le the, the stratigraphy that would be visible in, the, in, in cliffs, in, let's say in exposed walls uh, of, of the, the polar deposits and the interfaces seen in, in rather echoes. For Marsis, this uh, was not really successful because Marsis has too low uh, vertical resolution, is more than almost 100 meters. Why so for Sherad, that there was the match was, was uh, closer, but not so exact anyway. Uh, again, lobate debris aprons, and this is the, uh, as uh, time passes and the elaboration becomes more sophisticated, uh, it was possible to map, and more data were, were available, it was possible to map the thickness and the different stratigraphic frequencies, sequences, sorry, in the, in the polar deposits, in the north polar layer deposits, and also to map unconformities to infer the process leading to the formation and migration of the spiral thoughts, uh, throats of Mars. Um, but we are talking about Mars's data here because that's where I, uh, where, what I'm knowledgeable about. So I, I, uh, I, I won't try to, to delve into details for, for Sherad. Um, the uh, Mars's data, uh, which you might uh, want to use one day, uh, are uh, complex to use. And this is one uh, of the reasons why I'm here. I'm trying to explain uh, briefly what the complexities are, first of all, to warn you about using them and also to, uh, let's say, stimulate interest in how to process them because to, to make, to produce higher level products that might be more easily used by a wider community. Um, the instrument is unfortunately, unfortunately very complex because it has to do a lot of processing on board. Because this processing substantially reduces the flexibility of further processing on the ground, uh, there are several possibilities, possible combination of onboard processing parameters that lead to several different formats and content of data. This is uh, the main reason why uh, Marsis data are sometimes, uh, let's say, puzzling. Um, however, um, luckily there is a sort of workhorse uh, 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 operation mode which transmit, uh, say, uh, which has constant characteristics. Uh, the, the signal transmitted is a chirp waveform. Uh, this is a trick used to improve signal-to-noise ratio and resolution using a dipole antenna, unfortunately, at two frequencies and using three different, uh, sorry, focusing data in three different directions to map the reflection both just before, just beneath, and just after the spacecraft. Um, okay, this is too complex, I think. But it's important to, uh, to remark that we do not get individual echoes. What you get is not really an echo. What, when you examine a single frame, as data are called, of Marsis, that's the result of the combination of 100 or maybe almost 200 pulses, depending on where you were uh, during data acquisition. And uh, maximizing the constructive sum of echoes from the desired direction, that's what the filter is all about. Um, sometimes uh, the echo is sometimes severely distorted by the ionosphere. The ionosphere is a, the plasma uh, of the ionosphere acts as, as a dispersive medium uh, so that lower frequencies within a pulse reach the, the radar later than higher frequencies and this essentially broadens the echo causing the loss of both signal to noise and resolution. Um, Yes, this is for the real aficionado. Uh, once they are on the ground, uh, the data are organized into uh, files that contain frames, so uh, the result of the onboard processing of several tens of echoes, uh, then, uh, which also are referred in space and time thanks to, to SPICE, to the SPICE library. And uh, this leads to, to a complex structure because you have uh, not one, but six different echoes for a single observation. 
uh, at two, uh, three at one frequency, three at the other frequency, and pointing in different directions, just in case. And in processing, the first uh, thing is to recover uh, the uh, resolution by correlating the received signal with the transmitted waveform, but also it's necessary to correct ionospheric distortion. That's what the radar gun of Mars is, looks like before ionospheric distortion, uh, which is not very reassuring, at least compared to what you get once you correct for the effect, which is much better and shows something here. Um, so, uh, further processing. Um, the geometry is provided, the PDS label is attached. This is a general structure. And uh, the problem is there's no software to handle this data. So if, even if we're talking about GIS here, uh, there's the whole layer of uh, software from the basic file up to the geographic co-registration of data that simply does not exist. So we do things by hand with MATLAB sometimes, uh, but it's not something that we would, would be distributing anytime soon. So we have a problem here. If we want to use data uh, in a system at large, uh, some progress must be made in this respect. There must be a way to make available to a wider audience the ways to manipulate the data. Um, we are trying to do something on that, uh, but and especially in terms of providing simulations. Uh, those simulations that I showed before uh, and are extremely expensive from the computational point of view. Uh, it took us uh, more or less one year of work to get them done, at least so far, uh, for, um, for, for all observations starting from, from, this, uh, from the beginning of the mission down uh, up to, to, to early this year. Uh, so uh, it's something that the common user cannot do and which are uh, really uh, necessary to interpret the data. This shows here. This is a simulation, of course, there's no noise, so the background is black. And here is the real data, and, and there you see here, there is something that does not appear here. So this tells you that, in this case, simulations are able to validate you, uh, to uh, allow, uh, are allowing, allowing you to validate the detection of something that could be a subsurface interface. Uh, or, yes, we think it is. Uh, so, this concludes my talk, and more will come during the hands-on session, and as I will hopefully present something about what I would be like to do in a more automated way with the data. Thank you, sorry.